Well, hey, everybody. I'm Joe Wilson, one of the pastors here at CCC. Really glad you're here today. Glad you've chosen to be here. Uh, you know, most people that know me, uh, or, or at least get to know me, know that I am a big-time Baltimore Orioles fan. And uh, yeah, uh, we're just going to take a moment, right? Because they've been a lot of fun this year. And uh, uh, tomorrow starts what uh, my friend Dennis and I call the three longest days of summer, which is also known as the all-star break, which means three straight days without Oriole baseball, something I don't need again until November, okay? Uh, now, while I am a big-time Orioles fan, they have not always been easy to root for. Uh, you know, back in 1996, the Orioles had a really good year. They made the playoffs in the wild card. Uh, they were within a Jeffrey Mayer fly ball of possibly going to the World Series. And then in 1997, they led the AL East from wire to wire. And they led the majors in payroll that year, believe it or not. But again, they lost in the league championship series, which is just one step away from the World Series. But in 1996, the owner was getting restless. Uh, he fired beloved play-by-play -play announcer John Miller for not being more biased towards the home team. And in 1997, just a year later, he fired Davey Johnson for disagreeing with ownership. And if you've been around here for a few weeks, this was all very Nebuchadnezzar-like. Uh, <laughs> starting the following year, 1998, uh, the Orioles stopped renewing the contracts of their best players, and that started 14 straight losing seasons and 19 losing seasons out of 24. Uh, a lot of losing baseball around here. Now, on the positive side, for those of us who love the game, it was never hard to get a good seat during those years. <laughs> and uh, I never had so many front row seats as uh, during that 14-year stretch. Uh, but before the losing started, I can remember all the way back in 1997, the Orioles were dragging their feet at re-signing their ace pitcher at the time, Mike Messina. And I remember John Miller saying, the handwriting is on the wall in Baltimore, right? The losing hadn't started yet, it was coming. That's an interesting phrase. The handwriting is on the wall. When we hear that phrase, you know, we know what that means. That means that somebody's fate is sealed. It hasn't happened yet, but it might as well have happened. You know, you might hear somebody say, I haven't lost my job yet, but the handwriting is on the wall. They're laying off 50 more people tomorrow. We know what that means. In other words, all the signs are there. It's all but official. There's no escape. It's Schrodinger's cat for you philosophy majors, both of you. Uh, <laughs> the handwriting is on the wall. You ever wonder where that phrase comes from? Uh, you might know if you've been reading ahead in our study on Daniel that it comes from the Bible right here in the book of Daniel. Now, we've been in this teaching series over the last month about the life and times of the biblical character Daniel, and we've called this uncompromising, and that's fitting because Daniel was a man of uncompromising faith in a culture that was not moving the same direction as him. As a man of faith, he was swimming against the current, but he was undeterred by his surroundings. He stayed the course of his faith even when the pressures to conform were great, and even when the opportunities to make decisions to wander from his faith would have been really easy to make and nobody would have ever been the wiser. His uncompromising faith ought to be an inspiration to us, particularly as we try to live Jesus-honoring lives in the culture that we live in. Now, as we continue this study together today, we come to an instance where Daniel is called to interpret another message from God to another ruler. And you'll remember right away that this is not the first time that he's been put in this position. It's not an easy truth that he's going to have to tell, but he does it. And here's the unusual part. The message itself is actual, literal, handwriting on a wall. It's the first and most literal uses of that phrase. And we're going to get there in a few moments, but we're going to pick this up at the beginning of chapter 5 in the book of Daniel, and it begins this way. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. Now, 
immediately, what do you notice here if you've been a part of this study for several weeks? No Nebuchadnezzar, right? Nebuchadnezzar ruled for 43 years, and now he's gone. In fact, he's been dead for quite a while when this chapter takes place, a couple of decades. There have been at least two significant regime changes in Babylon with some real Shakespearean stuff going down as those things happened. And now we see that there's a new sheriff in town, a guy named Belshazzar, and this is 20 or so years later. Belshazzar is the ruling king of Babylon. So let's go over this again. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines drank from them, and as they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. So we have here, Belshazzar throws a party, and it is for the who's who of Babylon. And an important backstory you're going to want to know about this is politically at this point, his kingship is not in great shape. There's a new international bully that's kind of on the scene, the Persians. In fact, the Persians have already been taking little bits and pieces of the Babylonian empire. And Belshazzar is kind of ignoring them, and he is fortressing himself up in the well-fortified capital city, Babylon. Historians say that they had about 20 years' worth of supplies stored up in that city. In fact, when the leader of the Persians, a guy that was known as Cyrus the Great, when he saw the city of Babylon, this is what he said, I am unable to see how any enemy can take walls of such strength and height by assault. So Cyrus shows up at Babylon and says, this city is so well fortified. I, I don't see how anybody's getting in there. And you might recall from last week uh, that there's this scene where Nebuchadnezzar's kind of walking up on, on top of the walls of the city, right? He's looking at these series of fortified walls of, of his impenetrable city, admiring his work, looking and saying, look at what I've built. Look at this great city. There's a lot to admire there. The city was virtually impenetrable. And Belshazzar and his people felt so self-sufficient. Not only were they well supplied, but the Euphrates River ran under the walls of the city into the center of Babylon, and from that river, canals were, were, were dug in every direction. You might remember in the Old Testament, the, the children of Israel, they're taken into captivity here, and they lamented in Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. This is what they're talking about right here. And so Belshazzar is walled up in his city. He's feeling secure knowing that he can outlast the Persians for 20 years if necessary. And he has adopted the life motto, eat, drink, and be merry. So he decks out the largest room in the palace. He throws a party, and the place is packed. The Bible tells us that there's over a 1,000 people at this party. I mean, it's like pizza Geddon, but with a lot more drunkenness, cussing, and nakedness. Come to think of it, it's nothing like Pizzageddon, okay? <laughs> the atmosphere just goes down fast, okay? And in the middle of the party, Belshazzar gets this inspired idea, mostly inspired from the wine. And he says, somebody go to that storeroom where all the artifacts are stored and bring out those ornate goblets that Nebuchadnezzar took from Jerusalem, from the temple there. I, I want to see those and they do. Now, these were sacred objects. They had been dedicated to the worship of the one true God of Israel, Jehovah. And now they're going to be used as vehicles in this very hedonistic party. And in the midst of it all, Belshazzar and his guests start toasting and start singing their songs that acknowledge these false gods, these gods of silver and gold. And it's just a mess. The party becomes more lewd and more sacrilegious by the moment. Now, the guests think they're having a great time, right? I mean, they're limited up. They are denying themselves no pleasure. 
Belshazzar has his whole harem present. The Bible makes a point of telling us that a couple of times. Impulse control is gone. For a thousand people, it's gone. Every kind of immorality flanked by, by blasphemy and sacrilege, they are profaning what is meant to be holy. And the question I want to ask you to think about for a moment is, what does God think about this? I mean, as he looks down on this, what's he thinking? Is this his design for humanity at its best? Do you think he's, he's looking down saying, you know, this is what I had in mind when I created people, this. Do we think God's pleased by this? Not at all, right? And he's about to step in, in a dramatic way. And at the height of the party, in the midst of the revelry, Belshazzar experiences one of the greatest buzzkills in all of history. Verse 5 says, suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared. It's enough. <laughs> and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. And the king watched the hand as it wrote. And his face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. Notice all the colloquial phrases that we're getting out of this chapter in the book of Daniel. The first is the handwriting on the wall. Now we read that Belshazzar is so afraid that his knees knock together, that all the blood drains from his face. I mean, these are all Bible phrases, and they're describing Belshazzar's fear. You see, there's no doubt in his mind this is real. This is not a drunken hallucination because everybody else can see what's happening right by the lampstand. It's in, in the bright light. Now, you know, this is not the first time that we see God stepping in in the book of Daniel. But every other time God has had something to say, it's been through a dream. Nebuchadnezzar has dreams. Daniel has dreams. All where God communicates something. Now, why does God deviate from that communication form? Well, I think... Unlike his personal communication with Nebuchadnezzar, God wants everybody to see this message. After all, they had all participated in the revelry. Now they're all going to see what is a very public rebuke. So fingers appear out of the wall, and they begin to carve this message into the plaster. You know, I have uh, two grandsons. Uh, they are named Ezekiel and Gideon. Uh, Ezekiel's six years old, and Gideon is three years old. Ezekiel just finished kindergarten this year. And uh, throughout the year, Ezekiel has been learning to write all of his letters, to write his name, to write basic words. Well, one day, uh, just before Christmas uh, this last year, my daughter walks into the room to find the name of my three-year-old grandson, Gideon, written on the wall in Sharpie. I think I have a picture here of what that looked like. Um, Maybe. Maybe not. Uh, so, got a picture of that. And uh, there we go. All right. In Sharpie, on the wall. Now, it was obvious that Gideon at three could not have done this. But Zeke kept denying authorship. It's not my name, right? That's Gideon's name. Gideon must have written it. And my daughter knew, as we all know, there's no mistaking who did this, right? Well, here's the deal. There's no mistaking who the author is of the message that Belshazzar sees. And he gets sober real quick. Fingers appear through the wall, the Bible says. They start writing into the plaster. It scares him silly. And maybe one of the scariest things about all of this is he doesn't understand the message, and so he summons all the astrologers. He summons the sorcerers and all the wise men that he can think of. And he promises them the moon. I'll give you gold. I'll give you silver. I'll give you all a new wardrobe. I'll give you power. I'll give you prestige. You'll be my right-hand man. He makes all kinds of promises to anybody. If you can just interpret this message on the wall, can you tell me what it says? And they can't do it. 
They can't interpret the writing. And so the Bible says that Belshazzar gets even more stressed out in this, that the smartest people in his kingdom don't have an explanation. And he's on the verge of a panic attack. You would be too. Well, luckily, his mom was close by, and Belshazzar's mother, who was Nebuchadnezzar's daughter, she steps in, and she says, son, don't despair yet, I know a guy. Don't you love the people in your life that say, I know a guy? I mean, aren't they just wonderful people to have around? I mean, they always have the right contact, whether you're trying to rewire your house or find a dog trainer. I mean, they know the person to call. Well, here is the queen mother, and she says, I know a guy. My father used to have a guy who could answer these kinds of calls. He was wise. He could interpret dreams. He was so great that your grandfather had him as one of the highest ranking positions in the whole country. His name's Daniel. And she gives him this glowing review, and she basically says, if I were you, I'd call Daniel. Daniel can get it done. Daniel's a can-do guy. You should send for him. You ought to call Daniel. I mean, she just lays it out there. And Belshazzar is filled with... Daniel is brought before the king. Now, just as an aside, this is a reminder that even evil kings listen to their mamas. Okay? So, (laughs) that is the power of moms. Daniel's brought before the king... And I want you to remember, this is not the up-and-coming king or the the up-and-coming kid, you know, out of Jerusalem anymore. Daniel's probably in the neighborhood of about 80 years old here. He's been around. You know, he's seen the royal circus. And as soon as he walks in the room, it does not take him long to size up the situation of what's been happening. The room is trashed. There are people in various states of drunkenness and immodesty. And Belshazzar is overwhelmed. And before Daniel can even get a word out, the king immediately makes Daniel the same offer that he'd made to all his unsuccessful sorcerers and advisors. He promises him the moon. He says, Daniel, your reputation precedes you. If anybody can interpret this message, we're told that it's you. And if you do this, I'll make you rich and I'll make you powerful. I'll make you influential. And Daniel's not impressed. Right out of the gate, Daniel just says, hey, I'm not here for the rewards. You can keep the rewards. You can give the rewards to somebody else. But I will tell you what the message means. But before he does that, he decides that he is going to seize this opportunity as a teachable moment. He sees the room. He gets the vibe. And he gives Belshazzar a brief history lesson. He says to him, hey, your grandfather had a pride problem. I mean, he was a great king, Nebuchadnezzar was, but he was all about himself. And it got so bad that God had to humble him in a really public way. And if you were at at CCC this last week, this is what David taught about. If you've missed some of those messages, I encourage you to go back, catch up on them. Really great stuff. But Daniel reminds Belshazzar, God made your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, he had made him great, and then he made him like an animal. And he lived in the fields, and he ate grass like a donkey, and he lived without shelter, and he was completely humbled until he came to his senses and recognized the God of heaven, and that it was God who set up kings, and God who deposed them. And you saw this, Belshazzar. I mean, you were younger, but you saw this. You witnessed it. Now, we're going to pick it up here in verse 22. But you, Belshazzar, his son, you've not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you've set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You've had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles and your wives and your concubines drank wine from them, and you praised the gods of silver and gold and of bronze and of iron and wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand, but you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life. And all your ways. Let's break there for a minute. Has Daniel interpreted the message on the wall yet? No, he has not. But if you're reading the room, how are things looking? 
I mean, if Belshazzar's shaking up his magic eight ball right now, it's saying outlook not so good, okay? <laughs> what is David saying to the king? Or what is Daniel saying to the king? He's saying, you learned nothing. You should have known better. You, 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 you could have been wise. You could have learned. And specifically, what was Belshazzar's sin? Verse 22, verse 23 says it's plainly, you have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You know what he's saying here? Belshazzar, you're worried about your kingdom. You're worried about the Persians. The Persians are the least of your worry. You have set yourself up against the God of heaven, the God who holds your life in his hands. And in case you didn't realize... It's not wise to put yourself at odds against the God of heaven. Now, here's where we actually learn about the handwriting on the wall. Verse 25. This is the inscription that was written. Mini, mini, tekel, parson. Now, I'm going to tell you what those words literally mean, and then we'll read Daniel's interpretation of the message. These words have both a noun usage and a verb usage. Taken as nouns, they are all weights and measures and and, and currencies. Taken as verbs, they mean something else. The first word is mini. As a noun, it means one mina, which was the equivalent of 60 gold shekels. As a verb, it means to number. Okay? And this word is written twice in a row. The next word is the word tekel. As a noun, it is the Aramaic form of the word shekel. Okay? Again, a currency here. As a verb, it means to weigh. And then the last word, parson. As a noun, it means a half mina. But as a verb, it means to break apart. Okay, so think about this. Daniel is, is reading these words aloud, and literally in one sense, you could read these words, and it would be like saying, quarter, penny, dime, okay? You read it another way, and it means numbered, numbered, weighed, and broken, and this is how Daniel interprets it. Notice, here's what these words mean. Meaning, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. And Perez or Parson, your kingdom is divided. It's broken up and it's given to the Medes and the Persians. Now, this is not the message (laughs) that Belshazzar wanted to hear. And I think maybe at this moment, there's a pregnant pause, and he's hoping for a reprieve. He's probably thinking, man, I got to straighten up. Maybe he was waiting to see if Daniel would continue by saying, but if you do this, O great Belshazzar, and kind of fill in the blank, right? I mean, after all, when Nebuchadnezzar had the dream about going insane, it took a whole year before that judgment took place. And Daniel even offered Nebuchadnezzar in that moment. He said, well, perhaps if you change your ways, perhaps if you do this. And I think Belshazzar is hoping for something like that. But verse 30 says, that very night Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. There would be no reprieve. Daniel was revealing a judgment that had already been pronounced. No more time for change. The handwriting was on the wall. Belshazzar's fate and the fate of the Babylonian Empire was set, and it happened that very night. You see, things were already set in motion when this party started. Secular historians corroborate the biblical account here, that Babylon was taken without incident while the people partied. You see, while this drunken feast was going on, Cyrus the Great, the Persian, Instead of trying to breach those impenetrable walls of Babylon, 
he pulled a John Dutton and he diverted the Euphrates River. <laughs> the whole river. And the army took the city by surprise coming under the fortified walls on a dry riverbed. And history turned the page. And Daniel records all this for us. Not simply as a, just a historical account, but he records it so we can learn. And so before we close this out, I, I want to be sure that we've acknowledged at least a couple of lessons that Daniel's giving. The primary thing I think we have to learn here is that we need to be humble. God values our humility so highly. In fact, I would go so, so far as to say this. He values it above almost any other characteristic that we can possess in our lives. And this is a recurring theme in the book of Daniel. Almost every one of the first eight chapters of the book of Daniel are reminders of what happens when pride goes unchecked. And in chapter 5, Belshazzar is so full of himself, so confident in his city walls, so confident in his 20-year storehouse of supplies that he throws a drunken kegger for the most valued and honored guests so they can participate in every indulgence all while the enemy is at the gate. And in the middle of the drunkenness, he serves up some blasphemy with a side of sacrilege. Let's use those things that were set aside for the worship of the God of heaven. Let's indulge ourselves. Let's toast to false gods as if God would not be offended by this. Now, here's the deal. Most of our pride is not nearly this overt, <laughs> but that doesn't make it less offensive. We consistently ignore God. We do not give Him the rightful place that He deserves in our lives. We live our lives in such a way that God and the things of God often are just an afterthought. And we continually place things above Him. Our intellect, our desires, our pleasure, our decision making. And we live day by day with this what I would call just a low-grade arrogance that we don't need God. And friends, that is a dissonant sound in the ears of God. Friends, if we leave a study on the book of Daniel this summer and you have not honestly confronted the pride in your life, you've missed the point, and so have I. Because more than just being a book on the narrative history or even prophecy, this is a book about humility versus pride. So ask yourself, are you regularly humbling yourself before God? Are you acknowledging Him every single day, His supremacy, His perfect wisdom, His unfailing love? Do you understand that He is the most high God who holds your very life in His hands? You know, one of the ways you can tell if you're being humble is that you find yourself praying more regularly because prayer says, I'm trusting God with my day. I'm trusting God with my activities. I'm trusting God with my decisions. Prayer says, I'm thanking God for all the provisions that He gives. Prayer says, I'm looking to God for direction. Prayer is an evidence of, an, of a dependence on God. So, are you depending on God? Would the people who know you best say that your dependence on God is a visible thing? Or in your heart, are you saying, God, I've got this. I've got this. I'll let you know when I need you. Because that's the heart of pride. So as you think about these messages in Daniel, you have to remember humility. How are you doing there? Here's another lesson from this chapter, and it's simply this. We need to learn from the mistakes of others. When Daniel speaks to Belshazzar, he gives him context. He says, you know, your grandfather had a very public pride problem. And God humbled him. He lived in the field like a beast for an extended period of time until he acknowledged that God was most high and that God was in charge. And Belshazzar, you knew this. You saw this. Why, he asks. Why didn't you learn from your predecessor? 
You know, Nebuchadnezzar's lesson wasn't just meant for himself. It was meant for you too. You should have known not to sin in this way. You know, I I have three children. They're all grown now. I got one girl, two boys, and I have three stepsons. So, I got six children really, okay? But when my boys were little, I remember a day that they were solely in my care. Both of you, all, all of you can gasp now, okay? They were solely in my care. I was working in my office, and my boys decided, this is the perfect time to play with the stove, right? Like kids do. So they decided to turn on a burner, you know, the old-fashioned spirally kind, right? And, it, and they decided, you know, that, when that gets red, we ought to touch that, right? Now, as I look back on this great moment in Wilson family history, uh, the craziest thing about it is they did not touch the burner simultaneously. <laughs> and as I remember it, there was a distinct break between the two screams. Now, you'd think one of them would touch it, and the scream and the tears and the, would dissuade the other one from saying, well, I wonder if he's just wimping out or something, you know? But no, they both touched it, which may reveal the disadvantage I put my family in in passing my genes to another generation, okay? So, but let's face it, we are all like my boys. We are all like Belshazzar. We cyclically ignore the painful consequences that other people experience when they cross the line, and we choose to put ourselves at risk as if those consequences won't be true for us. Now, I want to admit, there are some things in life we all go through the school of hard knocks with, right? Things that are outside of your control. But here's the simple truth. You don't have enough time in this life to make all the mistakes for yourself. And even if you did, there are some mistakes that are really, really hard to come back from, if you ever come back from them. If you are going to live efficiently and effectively as a Jesus follower, you must learn to learn from the mistakes of other people, which, by the way, requires the humility we were talking about before. Have you learned this yet? That by observing other people and their sins and their consequences, you can resolve, I'm never going to do that. There have been enough people in our society who've made life all about money only to find it completely unsatisfying in the end. You don't have to make that mistake with your life. There are loads of people in this life who have just gone through their whole life led by their feelings twist around in the wind. They live in constant flux because feelings are fickle. You don't have to live that way. There are enough examples of people who live solely for pleasure in the moment, only to shipwreck relationships with family or to sink their finances in a single moment, and then they live in regret. You don't have to make those mistakes in order to learn from them. You can learn from other people's mistakes. Why are we so bound and determined in this life to make every mistake ourselves and waste the examples of others? There's a section in in the New Testament book, uh, 1 Corinthians, where it basically says, you need to pay attention to the sins and consequences of others. And it lists all these examples of things that happened to the people of Israel and, and basically comes to the bottom of that list and says, These have been recorded for your benefit. So you don't have to do the same thing. So you don't have to make those mistakes. There is a better, more fulfilling way. And here's the deal. If you've been around CCC very long, you know. You know the benefits of living a life where you put Jesus at the center. You know the promises that are associated with honoring God and pursuing a relationship with Him. And conversely, You have plenty of examples of people who've blown up their lives and their faith for the pleasures of sin for a season, and it's time to learn from those. 
It's time to remember, you don't have to make every mistake yourself. And Belshazzar should have, and he could have, but he didn't. And there was no remorse until the handwriting was on the wall. I wonder if a supernatural hand from God appeared out of your wall tonight, what message would God write on your wall? What would God say to you? Would it be a warning? Would He say, hey, you're dancing on the edge right now. You're playing with fire and you're going to get burned. Would that hand write, change your ways while you can? Maybe you've lived a a life that's just ignoring God and you've got a self-indulgence problem. Would God write, humble yourself? You know, it's always better to humble yourself than to get humbled. Maybe God would write these words to you. Trust me. Trust me. I've got this. Whatever it is you're bound up in worry about. Maybe God would write this word to you. Persevere. You're on the right track. Don't give up. Keep going. What message does God have for you? What do you need to hear from Him? Now, the truth is, chances are a supernatural hand is not going to come out of the wall of your living room tonight, okay? So here's what I want to encourage you to do. When you go home today, read all of of Daniel chapter 5. I've summed up a lot of this for you. Read all of it beginning to end, and then ask God, God, what's your message for me? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, the life of Daniel, for his example, that it gives us something to aspire towards, his honesty, his truth-telling, his unwavering faith. And God, I think we all, we find ourselves in positions where you know, we struggle. We don't all struggle in the same places, but, but we're all fellow strugglers. And sometimes we let things in life get a little upside down for, for us. So we want to hear from you. Would you direct us? Would you allow us to hear your words clearly today? to know your will for us. Would you guide us? And God, we pray that we would be attentive. We want to be humble people. So we invite the sandpaper of your carpentry shop to just sand off those edges in our lives where we need to pull self away and allow you to have your your way in us. And we want to be able to learn from others. Give us, give us that teachability. But we ask for your guidance, God, in all of it. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.